And it's really rare for me to be allowed to introduce these two wonderful speakers in person. We usually just meet online. So it's a nice opportunity for us to be here all together today at the annual conference. And this session is called Developing Data Analytics for EdTech Support Planning. And Helen, Karen are going to be introducing themselves properly in just a moment. There's also a Q&A element, so this is a very interactive session as well. But for now, please do just put your hands together to give a warm welcome, and then we'll get underway. Thank you. Thank you for that welcome, and thank you for choosing our session to come to this afternoon. So Kieran and I are senior members of Imperial College Faculty of Natural Sciences EdTech Lab. I'm the data analyst within the lab, so I'm Helen Walkie. I'm Kieran Govley, I work as a learning design manager. And we were just having a little chat about what we were doing 30 years ago, and I was studying here at <laughs> Warwick, and wearing things like green Doc Martens and men's M&S cardigans, neither of which I have anymore to wear to the <laughs> gala dinner tomorrow. <laughs> and Kieran was talking about experience of ed tech from 30 years ago. Well, that, I don't know if that was much more. <laughs> it, it, it was probably not much, but yeah, I was just thinking about gaming and Nintendos and things like that. So, yeah. So, um, at Imperial College, um, there are strategic initiatives to develop business analytics across the university for different functional areas, and education is just one of them and also to embed a data culture within the university. So we're going to talk a bit today about how we've translated that to our own edtech function. So we are part of a faculty-based team. We have 11 or 11 and a half people, <laughs> strictly speaking, at the moment. We support five academic departments um, who have 4,400 or so students, um, undergraduate and postgraduate taught across about 100 programs. And in the sphere of learning, teaching, and assessment, there's been a lot of rapid change over recent years. And for us, that's been down to the reasons that are shown on the right-hand side of this slide. So some of it's pandemic, some of it is um, due to other things. And we're finding that there is a, a growing uh, support still for ed tech, growing need for ed tech support. Um, and we want to use um, business analytics, data analytics, to help inform how we respond to that change in need. So when we kicked off this project, we uh, uh, the first phase of this project, as we call it now, uh, we thought we'll better off having some aims and knowing what our output's going to be. Um, some of it is obviously trying to address the needs from faculty and monitoring the support requests that were coming in to help us to respond to those queries or those requests. Um, also giving our team a better chance to prepare for those requests and adapting to the changing needs uh, and the supports that were being asked for. And in that sense, providing the leadership that you should probably be giving in uncertain times uh, to the EdTech team, having a bit of a um, transpar transparent discussion around what's, what's on kind of workload level. And in terms of college-wide or more strategic uh, decision-making, financial decision-making, we thought data analytics would really support every argument that we kind of have, which is... Just... Yeah, you do that because it <laughs> doesn't want to work when I cross it. So Imperial College uses Microsoft tools um, like lots of other institutions in higher and further education. There are other similar tools out there. Um, we, uh, as Kieran said, this is our first phase of development of um, analytics and reporting within our EdTech lab. And we've chosen to work with Power BI as our business analytics tool. Outlook we use um, for our communication with departments. Um, we use Excel for more static data sets, so they could be comma-separated value files, but we just describe them as Excel spreadsheets within the team. And SharePoint as a repository for storing those static data sources, so the stuff that's in spreadsheets. And um, we don't use a purpose-built ticketing system for our service requests. So we thought a good place to start 
would be developing reporting around those service requests. So what we use instead is a shared Outlook inbox. So we encourage staff in the academic departments to contact us that way and we, res we respond to their requests that way. Um, so with that shared inbox, we can make a connection, a data connection from Power BI to um, an Outlook Exchange server, pull in lots of data about those email communications, add in some other static data sets. So one of the things we have in Excel, for example, is a lookup table that matches staff email addresses to the academic department they come from. So we're not interested so much in the individual members of staff for our reporting, we want to know their department. So that's a way of getting rid of some identifiers. Um, and then we organize all those data into tables and then again into a data model that allows us to build um, efficient reporting from those. Um, so all that modeling is done within Power BI, or within Power Query that sits in Power BI. And then we're in a place where we can start building reports, report pages with visuals and things that are um, meaningful to us and going to be meaningful to some of our end users. And we're then able to share those reports, some of the time just as static pages, um, as PDFs, and some of the time we will publish the Power BI apps um, so that end users can access them in the Power BI service, which is the web a service for Power BI, and then they can really use them as they're meant to be used, so interactively. Um, and we've used this method because we had all this historical data sitting in um, our shared mailbox, and it's allowed us to look back over a number of years, um, and it's a method that we can use in the future as well. Um, that's the great benefit of doing something in-house. You've got much more control over the data, how you clean the data, and actually what parameters you use to evaluate that data as well. So uh, I think uh, compared to maybe something like a ticketing system that gives or pigeonholes you into certain parameters, you got kind of like the full picture. Um, and yeah, that's one of the great benefits, the flexibility and the control of the data that you've got. Thanks, Kieran. So this slide shows an example of one of those um, pages from one of our reports that we've actually shared when it was used as a static page, as a PDF. So this was used in um, some discussions with our faculty operating officer about uh, resourcing. So it was giving a bit of evidence of the, the change in our um, service requests over time. So on the top left, it's just showing by ac academic year how the number of emails that we've received and responded to have increased, uh, generally speaking, and then fallen off a little bit in um, academic year 21-22. Um, on the top right, it shows that split by the, our academic departments, so we can see for each department how it's changed over time. And on the bottom right, it's looking at proportions of uh, service re requests from each department. And this is just a sample of, of what can be produced, um, but the, the graph in the bottom right really highlights how understanding your context is important. So you can produce all the graphs you like, but you have to understand your context as well. So we know that um, the departments that have got a small share of that email traffic aren't necessarily the ones who don't use technology-enhanced learning very much or the ones that might be more self-sufficient in using technology-enhanced learning. It's all to do with um, the numbers of programs that they have within the departments and the numbers of staff who are responsible for communicating with us about their ed tech needs. So sometimes that's a smaller dedicated um, group of staff within a department and sometimes it can be any of the teaching staff. Um, other aspects that we've investigated uh, include looking at the text in the emails and doing text filters to pull out mentions of specific tools so we can see whether there's um, a change over time in, in how much um, support requests relate to particular ed tech tools. We can also look at peak service requests, um, like peak volume of service requests throughout the academic year and look at things like uh, emails in terms of the conversations that they were in, so we can see if an issue was a quick fix within a day, a couple of emails, or whether it took place over a longer period and with a bit of to and fro between us and the academic department. So we can categorize things that way as well. 
And um, we've done a bit of work looking at trends. So this is just an example of a couple of ways that trends could be looked at. Um, on the left, it shows the percentage difference to the previous year. So it's another way of just seeing the differences year on year and where you've got increases and decreases. And on the right, um, there are two curves uh, on that graph. So it's partly showing that you can put two pieces of um, information on the same graph with different axes, and, and there are cases when that might be relevant. So this was looking at resources versus um, volume of email traffic. Um, so don't worry too much about what the resources one says, but the email traffic, we then wanted to make some predictions into the future. So there are ways of easily doing that um, using scatter plots in Excel um, and getting it to fit a trend line, and there, it offers you different methods to do that. So there are ways of um, highlighting trends and, and making predictions that are quite easy to do. So we've spoken about you know, the data. We also need to talk about the human aspects. <laughs> and uh, very much skills. Uh, in terms of data management, we needed some upskilling. I mean, I haven't worked with data management particularly. I've you know, run reports from different vendors and just done Power BI reports, but didn't have to be responsible for building those kind of reports and didn't really understand the structures and the needs of that. And likewise, several people in the team, everyone thinks they, you know, they use Excel, they're comfortable with Excel, and they have their own ways of using Excel. So there was some kind of uh, transition, uh, I think, is still happening. You know, people like color coding, for instance, that becomes completely useless information if you're going to import that into a Power BI situation. So there are things that, you know, practices, ways of working that we had to look at and are looking at to support better data management. And then when it comes to the, the main tool we're using, uh, uh, Power BI, it was not a tool that I'd used before, and not, not Kieran, <laughs> very much. So we've both developed skills in that area, and we are now starting to do that um, with other team members as well. And we couldn't do that without a dedicated team who are um, with more expertise than us in our IT department. So um, we do have a business analytics group within IT, um, and there, there is also a community of practice where we can ask each other questions and, and get answers. Um, but IT need to do the bit when we want to publish apps and, and share them with users in an interactive fashion. We need pro Power BI licenses to do that. And, and they have a whole sort of checklist um, to make sure that we, we're adhering to GDPR and um, data security and all the rest of it before we can actually publish an app. Um, so we, we rely on them for that. We couldn't do it without them. And whatever we produce, uh, we realise that actually our end users necessarily within our team or the education office don't necessarily understand our outputs. So we had to give some training or guidance around that as well because sh um, Power BI being uh, interactive, uh, things like drilling down on data, understanding what it really stands for, uh, was something that we need to provide as well. And that we foresee having to do that uh, when we you know, increase our engagement with our different stakeholders, whether it's academics or uh, senior management. So end user training is going to be part of that uh, cycle, I think. And um, moving on, um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I just thought this is a time for a little interactive session. We've talked a lot about data, so we wanted to hear from you guys really about uh, what your data collection methods are. And I think it should come up here now. We've got a couple of VBOX questions. Oh, there you are. So this is the first one. So we'd like to know what tools you use to monitor your own support requirements if you're supporting, if you have that supporting function. Shared inboxes. Yeah. <laughs> so email and our service now. Yeah. Or other ticketing systems. Spreadsheet magic. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> they can be magical spreadsheets. Depends how you set them up. Mm. 
That's great. Thank you. Yeah, so a lot of commonality. So with the emails and ticketing systems of, of various sorts, um, Power BI mentioned in there, um, and uh, various other planning or tools to aid planning. I think Thank I you. use Zendex somewhere, somewhere. It was, <laughs> yeah, we moved away from that. <laughs> um, so next question is how do you use the insights from data? If you want to answer that, we're going to keep this as an open question and you can come back to this during our talk as well. Yeah, so we'll come back and look at um, some of the responses you've put in towards the end. Okay, so trends, nice. We'll leave you adding. Okay, I'll move on. Oh, sorry, do. Sorry, can you help? <laughs> yeah, you will Oh, just looks different here, sorry. So the importance of data. So uh, we talked about the importance of data, but there are elements that we also want to mention, which kind of makes, gives us the full picture. And also how data analytics can help us lead. Uh, we were thinking about it in three different levels, really. So at team level, uh, we're thinking that you know it creates that culture of visibility uh, and also support in terms of capacity making and going beyond you know coping your day to day and actually have a chance to plan and think about your workload. So that's kind of like a team level. Uh, for academic departments, uh, we believe that using data analytics, we provide insights uh, to identify the areas they need more support with or could you know, um, actually ask themselves why they don't need more support in that area. And actually just mostly use as a conversation striker where you can talk about different level of ed tech support. Uh, in terms of college, we think that uh, college-wide, we support the wider evidence-based kind of culture that we have and research that is needed around data and, um, yeah, supporting good decision making, which is kind of like the next slide. So yeah, with leadership, decision making, it's kind of similar things, but um, operating at that level, uh, we think, again, team will be well supported in making those decisions. So it just gives them that um, empowerment to do that, go ahead, uh, backing, backed up by data. And for academic departments, again, it gives them a clear indication of where budgets are going, where resources are going. And for college-wide, we think we're supporting, again, the data, influence of the data structures uh, so they know how uh, faculty uh, statuses are with data and we can kind of inform each other what college data is required to support faculty and vice versa. So uh, next slide is, ah, oh, there it is. <laughs> this is another <laughs> visual. This yeah. is another visual we've created um, for a slightly different purpose. So Imperial has a, it's just a, to give you another example. Um, Imperial has a focus at the moment on assessment load. So one of the things that we've been doing uh, to help departments in their um, decision making is to visualize or pr provide them with a way of visualizing where their assessments fall. So this shows all the modules for a particular program in the spring term um, and where the numbers of um, assessments fall in time for those modules. Um, and because it's interactive, it will, oh, I didn't show that bit. Um, they could hover over if they had the interactive access and see um, some details of those three assessments that fall for a particular module in uh, the month of March, for example. So, <laughs> uh, those were some examples. And um, as I said earlier, you know, data in itself is uh, seldom enough and there are limitations and therefore we rely heavily on other avenues and there, there'll be conversations, feedback from surveys, uh, consultations, observations going into actual uh, lecture halls and seeing how 
uh, techies being used, so and workshop outputs. So I think hard data is only valid if it's placed in our context, as we said. There's so much that we know because we do it day in and day out, and it's uh, that translation we're trying to work on and developing in terms of communicating uh, that outwards in combination with the feedback and everything else does kind of give us a richer picture, a better picture of what's actually going on. And um, working forward, we're hoping to drill down more on tools. Uh, so we've worked on our service request. Now we want to kind of know, yes, you know, 80% of the academics, or actually 100% of the academics use Turnitin, but are they using rubrics? Are they using peer marking? Are they, you know, really comfortable with the quick marks? We're hoping to drill down, and what data does Turnitin already give us? How do we complement this with our own data? So that's kind of where we see uh, our work going forward. Um, yeah, yeah, so definitely to develop that, um, bringing in other data sets with complementary information and, and build up a, a better picture. Um, and then continue some of the work that we've been doing to like the heat maps of, of assessments to offer that as a service to our departments. And it also has the benefit of being very good for when they're um, assessments that require support from us, from us clearly knowing what's happening when. And that's, we've, we've tended to be quite uh, reactive, I think, yeah. uh, within our team rather than proactive when we're thinking about when things fall. Um, understanding there's peaks in events, yeah, you know, yeah. uh, and letting our team understand the peaks in events as well, just to have that more yeah. forward planning. But we feel we've scratched the surface and that's... Uh, you know, made a start, and there's so much more that we could do. So it's um, exciting for us to have worked on it and continue to do so. Um, we'd like to thank a couple of our colleagues who've been um, heavily involved in this work along with us. So Ellis Taylor and Moira Sarsfield, who's our, the director of our EdTech Lab. We've got a list of some relevant reading, which um, will be useful when you get access to slides. <laughs> but we'd like to thank you for listening and hand over to you to see your responses to our second question and any other questions that you have for us. Thank you very much. So I think we can still see the responses coming in. Um, do you want to pick these up first and then we'll switch yeah. over for general Q&A? Yeah, what stands out to you, Karen? <laughs> Uh, produce support material or current topic questions. Yeah, I think yeah. that's something we want to aim for as well. Like yeah. if there is something that's constantly coming up as a support need, maybe we need to look at the help guides that we already have in place. Are we lacking something? Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a really good one, I think. Yeah, I think all of these look uh, are familiar to us in, in some way or another. Um, so like we've just said, we've been fairly reactive to uh, service requests in the past, and we do want to um, map that our demand a bit better and, and be more proactive in the future, um, and developing those support materials and interventions as they're needed um, is, is also really important. Um, prediction and improvement. Yeah. Yeah. We can improve in all sorts of areas. <laughs> Thank you. That's really... Uh, useful to see what you're all doing. Well, we have a few more minutes uh, for final questions, so maybe um, if we could switch over to general Q&A and give you all an opportunity um, to raise any additional points so that we can, we can have any um, questions or comments are also welcome. So we'll give you a couple of moments. I'm going to just jump in with a first question. You mentioned at the very beginning this was phase one, or the <laughs> current phase. So I'm very curious to hear wh where you're hoping to take this next. <laughs> <We're> <laughs> so I think we were hoping we had sort of said a bit about that at the end. So it's, um, there are lots of different avenues that we could go in. So, because, so within EdTech, we're very interested in how we can use uh, reports and data that we can get out of our tools. So we're discovering more and more that there are admin reports that we can't access, that our IT department can access, that tell us, give us more of an overview of how, uh, how many modules are using um, the discussion 
tool, discussion board tool that we have at the university. And it's sort of, we want to work out a, the best way of setting up data pipelines so we can incorporate um, that information to complement what we already have through our service requests. But also this work around um, assessment load and making better visual reports for our team um, so that they're better prepared th to think about what's coming up, particularly in the term ahead. Um, yeah, things like that. Okay. Well, we've got quite a few questions coming up. Um, I think we're going to, um, there is a couple of more technical ones, and then there is a couple more sort of about culture change. Mm -hmm. So maybe if we start for one about the, the culture change, about senior management, because I think that's something that I'm sure many people in the, in the room are interested in. So the question is, what engagement do you get in the data from senior management, um, or is it primary primarily used to inform your training and guidance approaches? That's a good question. Shall I start? Yes, I <laughs> you can chip in, Kieran. So we did um, another driver for looking at reporting in the first place was so that we could have more informed discussions with our faculty management and heads of department because we have quite a devolved structure at Imperial so a lot of the money sits in faculties and departments it's not from the centre um, so we have to win them over and, and um, uh, encourage them that they're, they're receiving a, a you know or ask them whether they're happy with the service that they're receiving from uh, EdTech and um, whether they we were asking them whether they wanted more of the same or they've got further developments to give or less or, and they were all oh yes we're really happy we want at least at least more of the same but being able to show some graphs and give them some figures to go with that was really helpful and um, it, you know having an evidence base and informed data informed discussions is um, really good and we found our, our senior management have um, really appreciated that yeah I think no one was questioning <laughs> in the sense you know if we were needed but as you said, the funding structures are thus, like, you know, some posts are linked to certain projects or certain departments and things like that. So I think it really gives everyone a bit of a transparent picture of, you know, how they are being supported. And I think that's one of, the, as you said, one of the drivers. So it was um, one of the reasons we kicked off the project to kind of back up what we were saying. You know, it's, it's not kind of... Um, enough for senior management to say, oh, you know, the volume's increased threefold. We actually needed to show <laughs> the volume has increased threefold. Oh, thank you. We have quite a lot of questions coming in. There is one, um, uh, it's a little bit further down, that we had around embedding the process so that this happens every year and um, making sure that you can then analyze kind of the trends. Um, I think we're just getting that up on the screen. And um, hopefully, yes, this is the one. Thank you. So. What has been the main challenges to embed this culture of data analysis within the team to ensure the same collection happens year on year, allowing trend analysis? Yeah, well, the beauty of looking at our um, service requests is that all, most of the data have just come from Outlook. So it's not required the staff to do anything differently. Um, we just have these odd lookup tables that um, Kieran and I can look after to um, <laughs> ensure that we get the information that we want. So um, from that point of view, looking at service requests will continue. We just we have a refreshing pipeline of, of data, so that's easier. That's um, the flexibility we had, and we yeah. could go, so even if we didn't start collecting this data pre-COVID, we could go back, and that was kind of like the beauty of it all, that we could actually go back and see pre-COVID levels during COVID and after, mm. uh, was because we were kind of basing it on data that already existed in Outlook. Mm. But when it comes to, so we, one of the things we talked within the team uh, about doing is having more progress trackers for things, and I guess it's in those circumstances where people are maybe using their colour coding in spreadsheets, and which works really well, as Kieran said, when it's just that one person or a couple of people who need to look at it. But if we're pulling data from different mm. sources and wanting to produce tracking reports from different places and, and show give them the same look, um, then they need to all be, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for, formatted in a certain way. Um, <laughs> And that's, that's a work in progress. So we've, yeah. we've been able to show to our team how it's easier if something's set up a certain way and get them to then use those spreadsheets to make their own updates and refresh the data and see 
how that changes the reports. Um, so it's gradually. Well, we had a recent away day where we actually are getting input from our staff members to see what they prefer as well. So thinking about creating maybe templates and we're also very conscious about people don't want to be tracking the work they're doing, they just want to do their work and we're thinking about how can we automate this process as much as possible so it doesn't feel like an additional thing that someone's yeah. doing but it's just part of your flow of your workflow if that's already there and that's what you do and it works for both purposes so I think we're trying to be super clever what was it magic spreadsheets yeah. <laughs> we're, trying to, we're trying to create those magic spreadsheets oh. that doesn't create more work for anyone but helps us to create reports well, um, I'm afraid we're coming to the end of time. There are a lot of questions and <laughs> yes. comments, and I hope that you continue with engaging with Helen and with Kieran via Discord and online. What a fascinating piece of research. Thank you so much for sharing that with us today. Thank and you. please do give our authors a round of applause. Thank you.